someone who's very, very private, they're probably connecting with people a little bit differently um, than someone who's very open. But when it's a secret that you're intentionally holding back, that you're choosing to be alone with, that's what's unique about a secret. That's where some of the problems can begin. You're not choosing to be alone with something when you keep something private, but you are when you keep something secret. Hey, it's Laura. Welcome to June. It's the first official month of summer, and I couldn't be more happy about that. At least that's when this episode is dropping. You might hear it later. Uh, Believe it or not, this month also marks the one-year anniversary of this show, of TMST. So that's exciting. And if you're new, welcome. If you've been here for the whole ride, thank you. We love you. And we've got amazing things planned. Here's to many, many more conversations to come. So today we're getting into a topic that is nobody's favorite ever, secrets. When we think of secrets, we think of lies and dishonesty, all those hidden thoughts and acts that might destroy our relationships or maybe already have shame, guilt, regret, all the stomach turning thoughts and feelings, right? Even the word secret feels scandalous in my mouth and to my ears when I hear it. So I know there were times in my life where the weight of secrets I carried was so intense, it made me physically sick. But I also know that at that point, I figured I would just have to die with those secrets because there was no way in my mind that I was going to tell them, and it just felt like there was no way out turns out this is a very real thing. Secrets actually do weaken our physiology and psychology. But also, many people don't feel there's any way out from underneath the secrets. And that's not true. There are options, as our guest is going to talk about. And the other thing is, guess what? We all have secrets. Everybody. (laughs) As you'll hear from our guest, the average number of secrets we have at any given time is 13, 13 secrets at any given time. I thought that was fascinating. So Michael Slepian is today's guest, and he has spent over a decade studying the psychology of secrets. He is the author of a new book coming out in June this month called The Secret Life of Secrets, How Our Inner World Shapes Well-Being, Relationships, and Who We Are. The title suggests a lot of what we get into in our conversation. We talk about the impact secrets have on our physical and psychological well-being, how they impact our relationships, how we can work with them so we give ourselves a break and drop the guilt and free up some of that mental space that secrets take up. And he talks about why they take up so much mental space, which I thought was interesting because it's not the reason you think. We also talk about the most common types of secrets, the difference between secrets, lies, and privacy, and what the research shows helps alleviate the shame and pressure of keeping one. So to me, this is just critical information we should have in order to take care of our mental health. And For those of us who are in recovery, it just underscores the importance of rigorous honesty as a regular practice. I know. Annoying. (laughs) So annoying. All Michael's work is backed by really strong research, though. This is not airport pop psychology stuff at all. He is the Sanford C. Bernstein and Company Associate Professor of Leadership and Ethics at Columbia Business School. Before that, he was a visiting scholar at Stanford University and received his PhD from Tufts University. He is an elected fellow of the Society of Experimental Social Psychology, has received the Rising Star Award from the Association for Psychological Science and received the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. So yeah, like the dude knows what he's talking about. 
I'm gonna let you get into it. I found this so helpful and I think you will too. And don't forget, there's a Spotify playlist that accompanies this episode and you can get that just by searching us up on Spotify. And if you haven't become a paid subscriber, we hope you'll do that. The financial support of all of you who get something out of these conversations keeps them going. It really does matter. All right, here is Michael Slepian. Hey, hey, it's good to have you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So in your book, uh, you start out with a really fascinating story that it's almost unbelievable that it happened when it happened. So can you describe it? The story you're talking about there, yep, very beginning of the book, is I had been doing research on secrecy for maybe two years or three years at that point, really, really early beginnings of the research um, before it became what it is today. And so I had spent the day um, on this job interview and I was presenting uh, to the folks at Columbia my brand new research on secrecy, this research I had just started. And later that night, I'm going to dinner with the people who are on my job interview and it's going really well and we're getting drinks and everything's great. And then I get this phone call from my dad and it's like midnight and I'm like, oh, I'm still actually on this interview. Um, I can call you after. And it seemed like you really urgently wanted to talk. And I, you know, I finally called him back and he said to me, you know, Michael, I need to tell you something. Are you sitting down? And Which he is never, you never me, want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you know, it's going to be something big. I didn't sit down. He, he told me, I am biologically unable to have children. He was telling me that he's not my biological father and and neither with my younger brother. And so therefore we're actually half brothers conceived from different anonymous donors. And that kind of thing to learn is obviously shocking. And the first thing I thought is, why are you telling me this now? And then the second thought thing I thought was like, well, this is okay. This is just what the reality is. And it doesn't really change anything for me. But later it made me think about secrecy in a really different way. And when I much later would ask my parents about what made that secret hard, they never said anything about it was hard to conceal in conversation or that it was difficult to do so. They talked about what it was like to just have to think about that thing on their own and, and there to be some uncertainty around whether that was the right decision and just having to live with it without being able to talk about it. And that turns out to be what my research would later show. Yeah. Did you, did they know the, what you were working on? The, the research was, did they know it was about secrets? They did. Yeah. <laughs> the, the irony wasn't lost on them, I think. Yeah. I mean, my, my mom told me that was one of the reasons she started feeling more like she had to tell us, reading about my own research. Ah, I was going to say, did that influence it? Yeah, because you were you were an adult. You were launched. It was yeah. it could have just gone on and no, nothing would have been different. Are you ultimately glad that, you know, it, it's such a funny question. You're not the first person to ask I'm it. Sure. I am. Um it's it's impossible to imagine a world where I don't know it anymore, but I don't know. It, to me, why I'm glad that I know is it only made the relationships that I had with that side of the family, my father's side of the family, more meaningful to me, that they weren't based in genetics or something sort of yeah. of that nature, that they were just, just as real. Um, that to me was very powerful to think about it that way. So I'm glad that I know, should they have told us sooner? Should they have never told us? I, I don't know how you answer questions like that. That's what makes it so hard uh, right. to have a secret, but yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. Okay. So what is the difference between privacy and secrecy? Because I think a lot of people get these confused. So privacy, I think a good way to draw a line between them is to consider privacy 
not everything you don't talk about is a secret, right? And so the things that you don't talk about, but you're not intentionally holding back just because like these aren't the kinds of things people talk about. We don't talk about our paychecks. We don't talk about our sex life. Um, often that is the case. There are people who are happy to talk about those things. Um, mm-hmm. But that's the difference. If you're someone who doesn't feel as comfortable talking about those things, it's probably just because in your circles, that's not something we talk about. That's private. But if there's a specific experience you intend to hold back, some specifically poor financial decision or some specific sexual experience to use the the same example, that's different. That if you intend for people to not learn it, then it's a secret. Yeah. And would you say that privacy doesn't have the harmful effects that secrecy does? That's right. So privacy... You know, someone who's very, very private, they're probably connecting with people a little bit differently um, than someone who's very open. But when it's a secret that you're intentionally holding back, that you're choosing to be alone with, that's what's unique about a secret. That's where some of the problems can begin. You're not choosing to be alone with something when you keep something private, but you are when you keep something secret. Are there differences between lies and secrets? they kind of fold on to each other some ways because you can lie as one way to keep a secret, but there's many other ways to keep a secret. And some secrets don't even need to be kept at all. They're just sort of unknown. And then you can keep a lie a secret. Um, you told someone something untrue and it's there's something really significant about that instance. We're not talking about a white lie. Um, and you're keeping that secret. Yeah. But then they're different in that you don't have to keep you don't have to lie to keep a secret and so there you can sort of draw a line between them too right there's the like a lie of omission is just you never told a lie you just didn't say it right yeah okay um so in the book you define 38 types of secrets that we typically keep and what was the the percentage of of sort of validity of that like if does that cover everybody So it certainly doesn't cover all secrets because that's impossible. Um, But it turns out that these 38 categories of secrets we use in our research really do comprehensively cover the things that people commonly keep secret. You know, sometimes the categories are quite broad and this is is what enables us to cover so much ground. One of them is sexual behavior. Um, Another one is telling a lie. You know, there's many secrets that can feed each of those situations. But when we ask people to look at this list of 38 categories and say, which ones are you currently keeping? We see that the average person has 13 of these different categories of secrets at any given time. I found that alarming. I was like, wait, (laughs) what are are the 13 things that I'm lying? Not lying. That was my thought. What are my secrets right now? And and is there, is that something we need to be worried about is what I'm. The ones you want to be worried about are the ones that are worrying you. Mm-hmm. There are some that you're like something from college and like you still haven't come clean about it, but like it kind of doesn't matter anymore. Um, some secrets, their relevance to our lives fade over time. And those aren't the ones that require action. But if something feels unresolved, that's when it could become a problem. Yeah. Like the the saying in recovery is secret. you're sick as your secrets or, you know, your secrets make you sick. What validity did you find to that statement? You're as sick as your secrets. It's complicated because the question sometimes comes down to what do you mean by secrets? And for a very long time, people have meant something very specific when they describe something as secrecy. uh, And they really described it as the moment in time when you conceal a secret. And so for a very long time, we've thought that's why secrets harm you because it's stressful to have to conceal them in the moment or it's difficult or taxing. But that turns out to be not the case. Um, Our secrets do not only exist during the moments in which we're concealing them, if only. (laughs) Uh, They exist well before and, and afterward too. And your mind can return to your secrets time and time again and that seems to be the situation where someone's well-being is is lower. Um, not the moment of hiding the secret or not the frequency with which you hide your secrets, but how often this thing just simply comes to your mind on your own time when you're not with anyone. Why do why 
do our minds wander to our secrets? I don't know if you got into that, but but why? You know, secrets are just like asking to be mind wandered to. Um, so we mind wander to things that are ongoing concerns. We mind wander to things that feel unresolved. When we intend to keep something back from another person, when we intend to keep a secret, the best way to do that is to just be on the lookout out in the world for anything related to your secret. Because if a conversation becomes related to your secret, it's like time to go, time to keep that secret. Mm -hmm. But that increased sensitivity toward things related to your secret is why we're so often reminded of our secrets, even in, in moments when we don't have to hide them. God, that I can feel that in my body. That it's like a hypervigilance that you that begins once you start to keep a secret. Yeah. Because everything and, becomes a potential landmine. And as soon as the moment you decide I want to have this thing secret, the moment you intend to keep a secret is the moment you have a secret, well before you ever have to hide it. You talk about how the actual physiological effect of keeping a secret that people imagined that a hill would be harder to climb, but also that were there actual physiological markers that showed stress? So we do see that simply thinking about a secret is psychophysiologically stressful. Um, it's, it's a little stressful to just like spend, if I said like pick a secret that's really bothering you, now think about that for three minutes. <laughs> it's like it's pretty stressful. Um, so that we can see these like physiological responses. And this is a this is a situation where you're not hiding the secret from anyone. You're just thinking about it. God, yeah. So what are the options? When people have secrets, my my thinking as someone who used to keep a lot of secrets, um, because of my addiction and the things that happened while I was drinking, I thought, I remember making, saying to myself many times, I will just die with this stuff because there's just absolutely no way that I will ever tell them, whoever the they were. But there were more options than that. And I didn't yeah. really realize it. So what are the other options? Another option is finding someone removed from it all and talking to them because when you're fully alone with a secret, there's no way or it's very unlikely that you're going to find a very healthy way of thinking about this thing all on your own. It's easy to sort of find the worst way to think about it all on your own and just getting another perspective that's not your own is so helpful because it's just really hard to step outside of your perspective that you already have. Your mean brain. I call it mean yeah. brain. <laughs> I have a very mean brain. I yeah, think so most like, people do, right? Like yeah, we I think we're yeah. our own self we're self critics, right? Um and so just having someone say like that sucks or like I'm so sorry you're dealing with that, that is really helpful. Or just any kind of advice or guidance or different way of thinking about it, it's a lot more easy to find in conversation than entirely alone in your head. Yeah. And and the burden actually does get lifted by just telling someone. Right. And it you you can the, the burden can become lifted just by talking to a third party while still keeping it secret from the other person. And sometimes the right decision is to tell that person too, but not always. And and if you're not sure, that's why it's so great to talk to someone removed from it all and see what they think. And you can get many people's opinions. Yeah. Um, anyone that you trust or anyone that you feel can keep the secret safe. What are the the dimensions of the three dimensions that you mapped out of secrets? So in we we've done this thing that is a little complicated where we have like hundreds of people creating essentially maps of secrecy and then hundreds of people interpreting those maps. By which I mean that these three dimensions I'm about to tell you, I'm not making them up. They come from thousands of participants' responses. And they show very clearly that there's three primary ways that we think about our secrets are three ways in which we would sort of compare secrets to each other. And one is how immoral you believe the behavior to be. And so secrets that are really high in immorality are things like cheating on your taxes, cheating on a partner, 
Um, then another, the second dimension is how much the secret involves your social connections and your relationships. Um, so all everything about relationships, everything about sex is really high on that dimension. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas secrets very low on the relational dimension just involve you and you alone. And then the third dimension is how much the secrets relate to our goals and aspirations, which often mean uh, in our professional lives, but not always. And so secrets about money and work are, are very high on that dimension, whereas the ones that are really low on that dimension that are not clearly based in goals or aspirations feel a little bit more emotional um, and sort of preferences, romantic preferences, um, experiences of trauma. You know, there's there's not a reason for those. And so they're both are deeply emotional. And so yeah. what's useful to know about those three dimensions is they each have an associated harm. So people feel more ashamed with secrets that they see as immoral. People feel more alone with secrets that don't involve social connections and relationships. And people feel like they have less insight into secrets that are not based in goals and aspirations that are more based in like emotion and feeling. And why you want to know that there's three harms of secrecy is because that means there's three ways in which a secret isn't hurting you. And you're kind of looking for the which one is most fitting because it's pointing you to a way forward. Right. So you you wanted to map these out so so people could figure out what to do. Yeah. Just like just knowing how to think about your secrets kind of is a really useful starting point. Like, is the secret actually causing anyone harm by, by me keeping it? Because if it's not, it really has different implications than if it does. What if it is causing someone harm? If it's causing someone harm to not know this information, and the question is, should you tell them? It's really hard to figure that out on your own. And so I don't mean for this to be like, here's my answer for all situations. No, but this is good. This is one where it's really important to consider whether you should continue keeping it. And it's definitely one you should ask for advice for because it can get so complicated so quickly. And talking to other people and seeing what they think can really help you find some clarity as to whether you should keep keep keeping it or whether it's time to reveal it and how, and how can you prepare someone for something surprising of of that nature? Something that I have learned in recovery is like uh, offloading your own guilt or your own shame isn't a very good reason to tell someone a secret, you know, divulge a secret, Um, especially to the person who may be involved in it. (laughs) It seems we're, we're all all roads keep pointing to this involving a third party. So, yeah. how did you how did you arrive at that and and figure that out? That this is like something that it seems so obvious, yet we don't do it. So the problem, or the reason why people don't do this, or the reason why we didn't think of this really obvious thing, is from this very small way of defining secrecy from from before, this idea that secrecy is the moment of hiding. And why that's not the whole story is because you can be hiding a secret from one person, but talking about it with another person. And, And it's a secret in one context and not another context, even if you're not fielding questions from the person who's supposedly are keeping the secret from, even if you've never had a conversation related to the secret, even if you've never had to hide it in conversation, it still can very much affect you and be on your mind. And we find that if you have a conversation with a third party, it actually doesn't reduce how often you feel like you need to conceal the secret because there's still that other person you're keeping it from. But it does reduce this harmful tendency to to ruminate Ruminate. on the secret. And so people get something useful out of that conversation that changes their thinking in a way where they start having a more healthy way of sort of interacting with that secret and their mind doesn't get stuck on it as often. I always think of it as like getting it out of your body. We call it in in my in my recovery circles, we call it like open your mouth to save your ass. So even the secrets that you have about yourself, like a way that you're feeling, it's not even a secret yet. It's just a, a thing that if you were to withhold it would become a secret, like a thought that you have. Um, like you talked about – uh, one of the big categories being extra relational thoughts. thoughts. Yeah, right. So just having the thought of, oh, I think that person's attractive and they're not my partner causes this 
they feel like that they uh, they can't express that. Yeah, it, there you can get stuck on that thought, and then you're in this loop. Um, it's really something people don't tend to talk about. It's one of these categories of secrets where it's very familiar, and yet we've never had a conversation about it. We don't like it. It feels stressful when we can't be our authentic selves. And to me, that speaks to truth. Like there's something about integrity and being able to just be who we are and not have our thoughts go in one direction, our feelings go in another direction, what we're saying be another thing. There's something innate in us that wants to be, you talk about wanting to be known, wanting like that being something that's very innately important to us and how that relates to secrets. Yeah, I, I think... You know, we all we all have secrets that we keep, but we also want ourselves to be known. And these two things are in conflict with another in some degree. Um, if there's something really important and significant in your life and other people don't know about that thing, especially people that you're close to, it doesn't feel good for them to for it to feel like they don't fully know you. And that relates back to this idea that what's really hard about secrecy is it's not the hiding. It's being alone or, or not being known. And so, mm -hmm. for example, there's this study from the 90s that looked at concealment of sexual orientation among men with AIDS. And the finding was that the more they concealed their sexual orientation, the more rapid progression of disease that they had and the more symptoms that they had and they died sooner. And that really, you know, is this like sobering idea that that concealment could be so harmful. But when we look at, you know, what makes that situation so stressful, it's not the difficulty of not revealing certain information. It's not the difficulty of saying my partner instead of uh, a pronoun. It, it's feeling not able to be yourself or feeling not supported to be who you are. Yeah. That's much more harmful um, than having to watch your words carefully. Yeah. It's almost like you are a secret. <laughs> you have to be, well, it, it, it's not even that it's, it's safety. Um, yeah. That you're not okay to be who you are in the world, which is much bigger than, so that, so that's the, I loved, actually loved that part of the book a lot. Uh, there were lots of underlines and stars and questions about concealment um, because there are a lot of people who have to conceal parts of, feel they have to conceal parts of themselves in everyday situations, in the workplace, in meetings, in social groups, right? So what is the... If the problem is safety, how do we address the problem? It's a tough one. That's a big one. Um, and so, you know, in the workplace is an obvious way or sort of an obvious place for me to think about this, um, being at a business school and, and thinking mm -hmm. about how we can make people feel that they belong. Um, you know, there's this increasing and rightfully so interest in sort of diverse workforces and, and leveraging that diversity. Mm -hmm. But the... The road's been a little bumpy in trying to figure out how that should be done. And it really involves striking a careful balance. Um, you know, the original ideas around how we should treat this issue is just sort of ignore social groups and sort of be colorblind. But that doesn't solve any problems. You know, ignoring problems tends to not help problems. Yeah. And then the, the recent push after colorblindness is this idea of multiculturalism, celebrating differences, but that also has a has a fault. Um, it can really too, it can easily slide into sort of endorsing stereotypes or expecting stereotypes. And so, what I'm finding in my research, essentially, how can we hit both targets and with getting the good parts but not the bad, is thinking carefully about the difference between inclusion and belonging, and mm. a safe space is. Is inclusive, just inclusion is not enough for the space to be safe. Um, and in fact, it can even highlight that it's not. Um, so if someone feels that they were included in a decision or got a seat at the table just because of the social category that they represent, 
that feels like being singled out. That doesn't feel like belonging. And so right. it's tough, but you want to find inclusion that fosters belonging and not sort of singles out lack of belonging. Yeah. And one way to do that, and it's not easy, um, is to show that people is to show a value of inclusion for different all social groups, but that the individual is not included on the basis of that social category, um, that they're included for who they are as a person. And that's what fosters belonging. So, so seeing seeing the whole as a collective and and ensuring as best as we all can, whoever the we is in that case, whoever the, you know, if you're at a business school, whoever the people are who are are looking at the student body and doing the the hiring that there's representation, but then also seeing people as individuals. Yeah. And then what does that have to do? How did you work your way into this? I mean, this this goes right back to being known. People Mm want to be known in the workplace. They, They don't they want to feel like that they're not part of this because of social category membership, or that's not the sole basis for it. And so where it can expect a secrecy is this idea of feeling like you can't be yourself mm-hmm. in a situation. And that turns out to be really harmful, um, even if it doesn't require a lot of hiding. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the executive producer of Tell Me Something True and co-created the show with Laura. You know, we have one goal here. Put something into the world that helps all of us figure out how we can have a better week. We think the best way to do that is to keep the pod ad-free so all of the work goes toward making something that's useful for you instead of hustling to keep advertisers happy. And this is where you come in. TMSD Plus is the membership program that helps to keep this show going. And whether it's through a monthly membership or a one-time contribution, TMST Plus members are super important because they help to pay for the pod's production and distribution costs. When you're a member, you get to join Laura for member-only events, send in questions for the AMAs, and you get access to the complete unedited interviews. It's pretty sweet, makes a difference, and you can make it happen with a one-time gift or for as little as five or 10 bucks a month. If your situation is such that becoming a member doesn't work, it's all good. We hope you enjoy the show, maybe share it with a friend or two, and we hope you check out the playlist we put together every week on Spotify. Just search the playlists for Tell Me Something True. It's free, and look, we're just thrilled that you're here. If you can become a member, you can find the link in the show description. Head over to tmstpod.com. It takes less than two minutes. Thanks a lot. So the lack of insight was a dimension of how secrets hurt us was we've touched on it, but I want to go back to it because it it was the least obvious to me. The yeah. shame is obvious. I always think if I think of secrets, I think, well, yeah, we keep secrets because we're ashamed. And I know because of my experience that I, I, you feel isolated when you have a yeah. secret, right? But the lack of insight is really fascinating um, as – Oh, as a pro- you you list three ways: shame, right. isolation, and lack of insight. Imagine there's something that's been bothering you, or there's something you're struggling with. Like, what's the f- and it's not a secret. Like, what's the first thing you do? You talk to whoever is like nearby about right. it. Um, that's how we figure out complicated things in life. We don't figure them out very rarely all on our own. But when we choose to keep something secret from everyone. You are all alone with this thing, and you're depriving yourself of all the helpful conversations you tend to have with things that require some resolution or some work. And so, like, the natural response to having a thought is sharing that thought. The natural response to, to be struggling with something is to tell someone about that and, and to get their help because that's where help comes from. But when we keep it a secret, we're we're shutting off those helpful avenues, and so you'll be you'll have a very specific way of thinking about that secret. But you're sort of closing yourself off to different ways of thinking about that secret. And maybe you feel like you know you're keeping it for the right reasons, but maybe if you pushed on that a little bit harder, 
you may think, well, actually, maybe I shouldn't be keeping this secret or, or maybe I should be talking about it with certain people. Yeah. And is it the sort of bottom line litmus test that you know that maybe you need to consider this secret and and ask yourself questions about it is if it just keeps coming up? Yeah. If it's something that keeps coming up, that to me signals there's something to do. There's some work to do. Mm-hmm. And that's really typically really hard to do on your own. You talk about confiding our secrets in others as a way to not be alone, but not hurting others or like creating irreparable damage in relationships. Um, this is something I said that people have in recovery have, I think, figured out really well. Um, but not everyone has that. Not everyone. I mean, we all kind of know a therapist could do that. Um, I think one of my instincts was that we don't really think we're going to choose people well, <laughs> that we're going to choose the wrong person or that we don't actually have anyone. What does your research show about who we choose, the types of people that we choose, whether yep. those decisions are are great, and and what is actually required to feel better? So I'll start with the last question first, which is what is required to feel better? Surprisingly little, which is why it's so good to talk to someone. We find in our research that someone has to respond very negatively, not just like a little negatively, very negatively for confiding to make things worse. Even just like a sort of little bit positive, little bit negative, um, like not a very very positive, res- like even just a like lukewarm, just a mere acknowledgement, just a mere acknowledgement, or just mere lukewarm social support or lukewarm advice is a lot. Uh, That's so interesting. And so we find even if someone feels like they said something only a little helpful, that actually is related to better coping <laughs> and, and less health problems. And so it seems like we actually only need so little. Um, And that's what I mean by this other perspective. Just whatever they say, the chances are really good that it's going to be helpful. And part of the reason why is we carefully choose our confidants. Um, And people really prefer to confide in people that they see as compassionate, um, people who will be non-judgmental and express empathy and and caring. Um, People, rightly so, target those individuals for for confiding because they're the ones who are going to sort of help you and give you emotional support. But people also really like confiding in people that are assertive. And it seems to be for the reason that these are the people who are going to push you to do something. Yeah. And then the third thing you want to look for in your confidant, not like, yes, they'll be positive, Maybe they'll help you and push you to do something. But the third thing is that their morality, a sense of morality is similar to yours. If you're going to tell someone something that's going to totally scandalize them, <laughs> that's what you're going to be talking about, not like useful right. advice and support. Um, right. So look for someone we would, who- We know that though, right? Yeah. Like We instinctually know that. We do. Yeah. Did you find differences in gender? I've been getting this question for a decade. <laughs> really? Um, so, uh, well, it, it makes sense though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like I, one day we're going to study it right, like do it and do it right. Um, but the quick answer to that question is women confide their secrets in others more than men. So I'm not saying keep a different number of secrets or, or keep fewer secrets, but mm. tell other people about those secrets more. Why? <laughs> There's yeah. why is that somehow wrapped up in gender? There seems to be something. There seems to be gender roles around sort of like being emotional um, and sort yeah. of ex- exposing that kind of emotional side of you, and that's problematically seems to lead some men to confide less. Yeah, I, I I'm not surprised. Let's talk about some of the the things that I liked uh, about the 38 categories of secrets is that they're not all negative or they're not all you know bad secrets there's positive secrets too and what you called secret joys can you talk about them yeah so there's this class of secrets that we evaluate the content of the secret positively and for many that's because we plan to reveal it at a later point um, a marriage proposal a surprise party these are secrets we keep in order to reveal yeah. But then there's something else, um, and that's what we're talking about. That's what I'm calling secret joys. That are these are things that you enjoy, but you don't like 
talking about it to other people? Or you sort of think that talking about it will not make things better or will it even make things worse? Um, and we're talking about things that you enjoy, right? So these are things like hobbies, like these are things like collecting coins, whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. uh, watching soap operas. And people yeah. feel really secure often in the decision to not talk about those. They say, you know, I know I enjoy this. I know there's no harm in doing this. Mostly, <laughs> you know, we can imagine someone who spends all their time watching TV or, or something like, you know, we can imagine it to its extremes. When we're talking about behaviors that are not at the extremes, there's no harm in keeping them secret. And people actually, it helps people maintain feeling good about that. Um, if someone's secret is that they play video games uh, and they just beat a really hard game, they're, they're happier to just live with that alone than tell someone about that. And the person's like, why would I That's care about stupid. that? Yeah. 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 I like the secret joy thing. Uh I think we have this idea that it's wrong to keep things to our to ourselves and uh, for ourselves, but I think in this category, it's it's something. There's something sacred about that. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and I think there's a lesson to draw for our other secrets. Our, our, how can we sort of be at a place where we feel like that good about it? You'll never feel that good, but like, how can you feel as certain that you're making the right decision and and keeping the secret? How can you feel like this is bringing some good or protecting someone. Like, is that actually what's happening? Again, hard to figure out on your own. Easy to figure out with just one other person. If we're all at any time carrying the average of what is 13 secrets, do we need to worry about that? I think some of those 13 are secrets we haven't thought about in a long time. And it's not that we're still working toward keeping them. It's just they've never got revealed. Uh, my parents' example is, is a really good one. Like, you know, they didn't tell us when we were really young that we were donor conceived because how could you have a conversation about that with a four-year-old? But then right. then at some point we were adults and it was like, well, <laughs> uh, I guess it's become relevant again. And this is kind of what happens with our secrets. They kind of ebb and flow their relevance to our lives and the burden kind of tracks that. And so if something comes back and it's all of a sudden an issue again, these like one storm and secrets can, can come back if they're somehow relevant. So I, th right. I think not all of them are like our most important secrets, but, and these are just the number of categories of secrets people keep. Um, the numbers should be higher in fact because oh, this is a number of categories exactly so people might have multiple financial secrets yeah so what spurred you to finally write the book and in writing the book were there surprises were there things that you did one of the thought the things that i found interesting in your book was the penna baker um work and studying that i am familiar with his work because of the writing aspect mm -hmm. and how writing can be therapeutic and so there's two questions here. One is anything that came up that was new in the writing of your book um, that was interesting to you? And two, why is writing not enough? Or is right can writing about your because I think a lot of people think, oh, I keep a journal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't have secrets. So some of the most surprising things I learned along writing this book um, was looking into the whole development of secrecy and kids secret keeping. I'm a social psychologist, not mm -hmm. a developmental psychologist, so I hadn't quite interacted with that yet until it came time to write the book. <laughs> and there's really fascinating research on kids secret keeping, but it's really disconnected. And so there was a lot of work trying to bring it all together. Yeah. Um, in terms of switching to another kind of writing, writing to work through your, your, difficult experiences. Yes, there's this idea that um, they'll call it expressive writing in the literature, the, the psychological literature, but you can just call it journaling because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that journaling helps and journaling can help is, is the useful headline there. Um, what is the potential help that it can offer? The idea is that you are keep, let's imagine you're keeping a secret 
you can't, there's no one in the world you can tell. Um, so at the very least, you can work through your thoughts and, and emotions and, and thinking about the future in, in writing. And the reason that writing it down is like it forces you to really think carefully about whether it's the past or, or the future, but sort of force yourself to work through a problem a little bit more systematically than just like thinking in your, in your thoughts. Freeform, um, right. But it, it doesn't work in all situations. And so if what you're doing is mostly rehashing past events, that actually can make things worse. Um, that mm. becomes essentially a written record of, of harmful rumination. And so what you're trying to do to leverage the benefits of journaling is trying to step outside of your usual perspective, trying to examine something from multiple vantage points, things that are really easy to do if you're talking with other people, but trying to do them on your own is a little fraught because if it just helps you sort of dig into your currently unhelpful way of thinking about something, it could either not help or even make things worse. Um, yeah. And it's really easy to get to get caught in like the, this unhelpful loop of thinking. And it's really easy to just jump right out of that loop by talking to another person um, and getting like, the kinds of things that you we're trying to get out of journaling. Yeah, right. It's like the whole <laughs> the whole thing is like, damn it, we need each other. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, a blank page is not going to say I'm there for you. I, yeah. It's not going to be able to offer you emotional support. Yeah. I look at it as just a conversation that I get to have with myself and, you know, what I consider to be a higher power. Uh, it's quiet time. It's solitude. But I, I know it's not a substitute. I know now it's not a substitute mm -hmm. for talking to a person. So uh, if you had to, to state one intention for this book and – yeah, what would it be? One intention, if you, what you want people to get out of it. I think taking a close look at the secrets you're keeping can reveal some surprising insights alone. But especially with if there's a secret that's bothering you or upsetting you in some way, talk about it. Talk about it with a third party, someone you trust. It could be a friend. It could be someone else at a bar that you're at. It doesn't matter who it is. So as long as you feel like they can say something helpful or that they can keep your secrets safe. And so whatever that means for you, recognize that even though it might be difficult and you certainly don't have to reveal it to the person you're keeping it from. Right. Although sometimes that's the right answer too. And so if you're dealing with something like that, all the more reason to talk to a third party who can provide some other perspective, some way of thinking about this that you haven't tried out already. Well, I love I love your work. I'm very excited that that your the book's going to be out there, and I'm going to tell a lot of people in my community <laughs> to read it because it also just um, pre presenting it from a research standpoint just sort of uh, pulls the I don't know the, all the emotion that we can have around our secrets away and just yeah. sort of presents this like beautiful clinical view of this is a thing that people do and like everybody does it. Yep. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. All right. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you want more TMST, head on over to tmstpod.com and become a member. Members get access to the full uncut versions of these conversations previews of upcoming guests, invites to join me for members-only events, and access to our members-only community where I hang out a lot. We decided from the beginning to make this an independent project. We don't have sponsors and we don't run ads. This means that we can make the show all about you and not what our sponsors or advertisers want. But it also means we're 100% reliant on your support. So my request and my invitation is simple. Support the show by becoming a member, or you can simply make a one-time donation of as little as $5. I cannot stress this enough. You can make a huge difference for as little as $5. Please head over to tmstpod.com right now. Tell Me Something True is engineered and mixed by Paul Chufo. 
Michael Elsesser and I dreamed up this show and we're looking forward to joining you online and next time on Tell Me Something True.